Proteins don't exist as just long strings of amino acids. They have these complex three-dimensional shapes. So how do they achieve this? Well, that long string of amino acids has to fold on itself. So there are actually three to four different levels of folding that that string has to go through to achieve this. Let's take a look at each one. The primary level of complexity consists of a long string of amino acids held together with peptide bonds. Now the sequence of these amino acids is really important. Because there are 20 different amino acids, any amino acid can appear at any particular position. But again, they fall in a particular sequence. The sequence in which they fall is going to determine how this protein can begin folding and the shape it will eventually take. And the shape it eventually takes will determine its function. Where does that sequence come from? Well, it is coded for in the DNA. It is the DNA molecule that holds the instructions that tells the protein which amino acids to put in which order to build its primary structure. At the secondary level, that long string of amino acids, that long chain of pearls, is going to begin to fold on itself and little shapes are going to begin to emerge. Now what's actually bonding here? Well, it's actually the backbone elements of the amino acids that are going to bond. So it's the things that all the amino acids have in common, the carboxyl groups and the amine groups. What kind of bonds are they going to make? We'll look closely at the diagram. Dotted lines mean hydrogen bonds. Hydrogen bonds hold these little shapes together. Little curly cues begin to form, which we call an alpha helix, and that should be an alpha, not just an A. Or sometimes they form these kind of folded sheets known as beta pleated sheets. So that should be a beta, not just a B. That little chain of pearls that was beginning to fold up into secondary structures is now going to fold over on itself again and form what we know as the tertiary structure of the protein. At the secondary level, it was the backbone elements that were interacting with each other and making hydrogen bonds. At the tertiary level, we're now going to get the R groups involved. These R groups are going to reach across the protein and they're going to make bonds with one another. And that's going to twist that protein into its three-dimensional shape. Because there are many different R groups, there are many different kinds of bonds that can form at this level. Here we have an ionic bond. Here we have a disulfide bridge between two sulfur atoms. Here we have a hydrogen bond. It just depends on which R groups are present and their position as to which kinds of bonds will form. There is a special kind of interaction that we need to discuss at this level known as a hydrophobic interaction. Now remember that some of the R groups are nonpolar or hydrophobic. Also remember that these proteins are going to exist in an aqueous environment, inside the watery environment of a cell. So when you have a protein like that that's forming and it's taking on a three-dimensional shape, and when it exists in water, it's going to fold so that its nonpolar regions are towards the center. In other words, this thing will twist so that its nonpolar R groups are pointed towards the middle away from the water. We call this a hydrophobic interaction. You can see one right here between these methyl groups at the end of these R groups. Now some polymers are done folding at this point. They only go to the tertiary level. If a protein can do its job at the tertiary level all by itself, we call it a fully formed protein, and there's no need for it to go on to the quaternary level. However, if that little subunit needs to get together with other subunits to form a bigger machine to do a different function, then it does need to go up one more level in complexity. We call these kinds of units polypeptide units. When two or more polypeptide subunits get together to form a larger machine, we say it has achieved the quaternary structure or the quaternary level of complexity. Here we have a protein 
that consists of two polypeptides making a bond with one another. Now it can be any number of type or types of bonds. Here we have hemoglobin. If you look closely, you'll notice that hemoglobin, which carries oxygen in your blood, is actually made of four subunits. And these four polypeptide subunits have to bond with each other in order for this thing to effectively carry oxygen in your blood. Now, why do proteins fold? Well, among proteins, structure is directly related to function. In other words, the three-dimensional shape that a protein takes on is directly related to the job it can do. This is especially important for proteins that have what's known as an active site. Here we have a three-dimensional model of a protein, and you can see that it kind of has this little cave in the side. It has a dent. That dent is known as the active site. Into this dent, a molecule known as a substrate will fit, and it will fit like a lock and key. And that's going to allow the protein to do something to that substrate, to break it or build it or move it or do something. If the shape of the active site is affected by a mutation or by damage, the substrate can't fit in there. The active site is ineffective, and the protein can't do its job. So among proteins, structure directly relates to function. Here we have four different proteins, each with different structures and different functions. The first is insulin. Now, insulin is a messenger. It is a hormone molecule. It's released by the pancreas when your blood sugar levels begin to rise. And so it will go out into the blood, and it will travel around until it reaches the liver. It will bind with receptors on the liver cells, and it will tell the liver to remove some of the sugar from your blood. The shape of this insulin is really important because if the shape isn't correct, it can't bind with the receptors on the liver cells, so it can't send its message. Here we have fibrin. Fibrin is used during times of injury, when you cut yourself, for instance. It's shaped like long strings, and what this will do is it will form an internal net across a cut, and if you look closely, you can see that there are red blood cells trapped in this net. So it kind of stops the bleeding at a cut until the coagulants and other clotting factors can kick in and make a proper blood clot. Here we have hemoglobin. Hemoglobin carries oxygen in your blood. To do this, it has to bind to iron molecules, and in order to do that, it has to have this particular shape. Again, it has four subunits, all of which hook together. Here again we have collagen. I mentioned it before. Collagen is shaped like a bundle of springs, and it, it's found in the deeper layers of your skin. It's what allows your skin to remain springy, to stretch, and to pop back into place. So four different proteins, four different structures, four different jobs. These things we call mutations can affect how a protein functions. Sickle cell anemia is an excellent example of a mutation that affects a protein. So to understand this, we have to understand hemoglobin. Here's the shape of a normal hemoglobin with its four subunits put together. Hemoglobin exists inside red blood cells, and because hemoglobin has this particular shape, red blood cells have this kind of a disc shape. Because hemoglobin is a protein, it's made of a string of amino acids, and they have to go in a certain sequence in order to fold up properly. In people with sickle cell anemia, a single letter on the DNA is changed. That results in a single amino acid being put in the sequence incorrectly. Look what that does to the shape. When this amino acid sequence folds up, it folds into this kind of weird shape. And inside the red blood cell, it sickles it. It pulls on that red blood cell and makes it kind of a crescent moon shape. Now, sickled cells like this don't carry oxygen as e efficiently as the regular red blood cells. They also tend to kind of pile up and get stuck in the capillaries, so they can cause a lot of swelling and a lot of pain, especially in the joints. So this is an example of how a change in a single amino acid can have a big physical effect 
on the protein and on the cells in which that protein is found. Now if proteins can be folded into a three-dimensional shape, they can be unfolded. We refer to this action as denaturing. Denaturing occurs because of an exposure to heat or strong acids or bases. And exposure to these things breaks down the bonds that hold together the tertiary and secondary structures. So that protein is broken back down into its ribbon-like shape. Now one of the major bonds that's broken during denaturing is a disulfide bond. That occurs between two sulfur atoms in the R groups of the amino acids. The effect of this is that sulfur is often released from a denaturing protein. So sometimes when proteins are denaturing, they smell little light boiled eggs. In fact, that's exactly what happens to eggs as you boil them. You may have noticed after you boil eggs that there's kind of a ring around the yolk. Sometimes it's kind of a greeny looking ring around in this area. Well, that is sulfur that is building up inside that egg from the denaturing of the proteins. And because there's a shell on the egg, it gets kind of trapped around the yolk. It doesn't hurt you to eat that at all. It just looks kind of weird. Another place you might find denaturing is with hair permanence. If you've ever permed your hair and noticed that it smells like sulfur, well, that's because you're actually breaking down the proteins in your hair and reforming them into a different shape. And so sulfur is being released from your hair as a product of that. Denaturing is also a problem in cases of high sustained fever. If you get sick and you have a really high fever for a long time, the proteins in your blood and in your brain can begin to denature. That can cause organ failure. That's the reason that doctors will often try to bring a fever down um, by dunking someone in an ice bath or putting ice packs on the body is to kind of break that cycle and prevent that denaturing. So denaturing is a powerful tool. It's also something you have to watch out for when you're sick. Hooray, you guys, you're finished. Arnold would be proud of you. You are now ready to attend class and put into practice all these great protein skills you've built up through this lecture. We'll see you then.